Wage workers and union yanks. Put on your shockingest balance sheet. Give the camera a taste of your good supply side. And a free recession in this economy? You'd be losing money not to have a recession. Shut up and take my money. It's time to talk tall to me. Welcome back, I'm Omen Said. And I am Nick McGill. Together we are Feckless Momes. And this is Hard Times. What? This is Talk Tall to Me. A tense press conference at the Central Banks of Prague Rock, in which nominal value Nick and opportunity cost Omen will look for economic indicators in every single musical track that deregulated rock band Jethro Tull has ever released. Yes, all the way from the boom and bust of Benefit to the socialism of the zealot gene, Nick and I will set a gold standard with Glory Row, calculate the compound interest of Cold Wind to Valhalla, and measure the productivity of Peabroke. And through it all, we will depend on the absolute advantage and the flute fiscal factors of Ian Antitrust Anderson. Nick, I keep telling you that the tall market goes up and down. You know, sometimes it's a it's a beggar's farm bear market. Sometimes yeah. there's a sea lion backslide. But even accounting for fat man inflation, nothing is easy. I know it's it's kind of controversial to some people, but I think I might invest in clasp crypto. I think. <laughs> I've got, got a little money flowing around. I've got nothing to say <laughs> about that. <laughs> Nick, welcome back. Hello. Hello, you you really you really tickled me on socialism. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, I had, it was a, it was a make it work moment. As I like Tim it. Gunn would say it was great. Yeah. Well, Nick, we are we are calf deep in the album that we are in, which is Broadsword and the Beast. That's right. We are halfway through side A now. We are we are on uh, track three off of side A. Very exciting. And that track is that track is fallen on hard times. But before we do that, let's talk a little more broadsword, shall we? Let's talk broadly about the sword. Yes, Nick. I think you have some quotes from the man himself from Brian Raby's A Passion Play. Yes, this is from, as you said, A Passion Play, the story of Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull. Chapter 20, The Broadsword and the Beast. Just a couple little excerpts here. A was an experiment with new technology, but The Broadsword and the Beast was a storming album that combined modern with more traditional sounds, while under wraps furthered the electronic experiment. Unfortunately, the Broadsword Tour was the last time Tull averaged 16,000 seaters in North America. From then on, nothing would bring back the band into the public eye at the level to which they had been accustomed. With Jobson and Craney returning to their lives, the drummer's seat and keyboard position had to be filled. Jerry Conway played the drums on the album, but was replaced for the ensuing tour by ex-10CC drummer Paul Burgess. Huh. Peter John Vitesse's cherubic face peered out from behind the mountain of keyboards for both the album and the tour. His talents far exceeded his obvious youthfulness. From a strictly quality-driven standpoint, Broadsword was vintage tall in all its glory. Yeah, I can agree with that. And just a uh, a little quote from Mr. Ian Anderson about the album. For some reason, that album, although not popular in the U.S., was very popular in Germany. Yeah, I read that. We didn't have a keyboard player at the beginning, so I did the first tracks. Peter Vitesse came in later and finished things up. But that album was done in a slightly different way, in that I joined in on the backing tracks. That made for a band feeling, a live situation, and I think it is reflected in the quality of the material. And I just want to piggyback on that, actually. I do have a little quote about the the fact that it, it boomed in Germany as well. It was their most successful album in Germany, bombed in the States. And Ian says, it's not like it was just as simple as the fact that Americans didn't like the sound of these songs. It had to do with a lot of the realities of the music business. Oh, interesting. The change in American radio, even the move from radio into MTV, which didn't work terribly well for Jethro Tull. Yeah, I can I can see that. I think that yeah. 
let's keep all that in mind yeah. as we dive in to talking about track number three off of Broadsword and the Beast, Fallen on Hard Times. Indeed, here we fall. <laughs> Nick, there we have fallen on hard times, a topic which you maybe would say based on our conversation last week is evergreen. Yeah, I was going to say, I was actually just writing that in my notes. This has, it just in, in terms of relation to, to last week, this kind of, it's not the same concept really at, at all, but it's, 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 it's kind of a bit of a negative connotation like, like last week's did. You know, he's he's kind of uh, hitting the hitting the dumps here in in terms of depressing content, or depression content. Depression depending. cut. Yeah, right. Fair enough. Well, let's uh, let's talk about the track musically first. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Amazing, wonderful, lovely, delicious acoustic guitar at the very top. One of the first sounds yep. that we hear. Yep. And some really great plinky mando again. Yes. I did not know how much Mando there was in this album. It does not come through when I listen to it very quietly on the vinyl. It's it's like saffron. It gives an effect to the dish, but if you don't know it's there, you wouldn't be like, oh, such a bold saffron flavor. <laughs> yeah. It helps right. to, it helps to meld together the yeah. other flavors. It's it's the background and in it it, it acts as the It acts as the canvas, you know, everything else is built on top of it. It's the thread that ties together the various other sounds. Yeah. The mandolin thread. But when you do hear it, like when I heard it with these really good headphones, boy, it's it's so good. It's so, so scrummy. Yeah, it is. As they say. We have a lovely flute frenzy starting in the beginning. Yep. Which is is a wonderful balance between being kind of on flute overdrive, if you will, sound wise, but also mm-hmm. sticking very distinctly to the melody. Right. Jerry Conway's drums in this are it's it's got a it's got a very industrial feel. It's got yes. it's, the sound is really starting to be without being the over the top synth 80s sound that we heard last album it's starting to get a real 80s sound to me yeah it is the, it the really overall. is and i like it i'm going to tell you I, I like it giving us a hard time my friends handing us the same I, I like yeah. 80s Genesis. I like 80s Tall. I like, there's there's something, I'm, there, it's, I am have a fondness for this sound. Well, I have a fondness for things from the 80s too, like you. Oh, Puddin. Look at that. Um, I'm glad you said industrial. <laughs> I, I'm going to put a flag in that. Yes, pin it. I pinned it. We're going to talk okay. about it later. The keys are really... I think I was searching around for a word to try to describe them, but actually I think industrial really does describe a lot of the the sound in that in those first couple of verses of the keys. They're they're pushed, they're they're modulated. Yeah. And they have that that really gritty tone, which is delightful. Oh, dear Prime Minister, it's all such a mess. And in a lot of moments, the keys and the mandolin are playing in unison, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is so cool. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll, again, a, a kind of a, a dichotomous turn here compared to, to from going from A to this. The keyboard and the synth, it's all so well meld together, you know. Yes. It goes hand in hand with the rest of the instruments as opposed to being like really front and center, which... Makes sense why Ian was worried about it turning into the the Eddie Jobson show with how oh, in, mm-hmm, how forward previous... he was during yeah, sure. A. Yeah. Yeah, I would say this is a more balanced sound. And absolutely really yeah. uh, this is one of the more balanced albums and well mastered albums I think that we've heard in a long time. Maybe it's really good. There was a real benefit in bringing in someone else to to do the mastering and to not that Ian was doing a bad job, but you know, maybe Maybe just having that outside perspective helped bring things together in a different way. 
it's just like never edit your own writing. You're never going to catch everything. You're never oh, ear. I never edit anything. <laughs> Nor do you hire anyone to edit no, anything. Nor that's, do I write. That's different altogether. <laughs> At let's see, looking for sunshine, our third, uh, our third verse there, kind of a bridgy chorus thing. We get some some slide guitar. Yeah, I was gonna bring that up. Yeah, what do you think about that? Looking for sunshine, oh, but it's black and it's cold. Yet you say the milk and honey is just. I'm not sure. It, I don't think it's like a steel guitar, like a lap thing. It's probably just like a glass slide on, on Martin's finger. But yeah. it's fun. It's a great sound. It's unique. It's very classical, like old schooly classical compared to the rest of the, the really synthy bits. But it works great. Works it's good. a little It's a little echo of Tall's roots in a way, going all the way back bit. to the blues. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I agree. I think it sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's fun. It's very fun. It's not it's not abused. It's not overused. It's when it's in there, it's great and it's noticeable. Yeah. A little before that, when we get into the oh dear prime minister verse, we we have a change in the keyboard. Oh sure. Yeah. I love the image of uh John Peter Vitesse in this stack of different keyboards. And you can kind of hear the effect of that on the album. You know, we switch from that really like key sound to the more sweeping string-like mm-hmm. sound paired with the arpeggios of more of something that sounds like a like a piano in the foreground. Yeah, it's a little staccato, right? It's like pling, 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 pling. I think he he's just kind of, he's hitting notes as opposed to like really working his way up and down the keys. Yeah, well, I think he's maybe doing both simultaneously oh, on sure. two different keyboards. So you get that combined sense of the like... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet that on tour... The roadies never placed PJV's keyboards too far apart that he couldn't play them. No, <laughs> I'm sure they placed them closer and closer together every night <laughs> until he was trapped between them like a like a little piece of grass growing out of the pavement. Just a uh, little Jack in the Green right there. That's a all. Jack in the Green. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know that's funny, kind of a funny metaphor for this song. I really think that the just before we get into the content at all, the sound of this album is very fun for me because it does remind me of like you have this very kind of techno modern soundscape yeah. and then you have a little mandolin breaking through the pavement. It's just so delightful. Yeah, that works. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, I'm curious about the quote that we heard where Ian said that he joined in on the backing tracks. Yeah. At first, I was a little confused about what that meant. I thought that he was saying that he sang backup. But right. clearly he's been doing that for, for ages. Yeah, why is that remarkable? I think what perhaps this implies is that previously the recording, and you know, this is a supposition, as we do, but I wonder if previously the way that they would do it is Ian would record enough tracks for him to sing over and then have the band play without him to create the music track that goes along with the singing and then come back in and play the flute. Oh. And maybe he was engineering during while the while the rest of the band was playing. So maybe bringing in a dedicated sound engineer gave sure. him the opportunity to play with the band in the recording studio, which is more what they would do, you know, on tour because obviously you have to because everyone's right. live. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I wonder what that setup was. That is all suppository. Yep, that's where it goes. That's where it comes from, and that's where it goes. But regardless, I do agree that there is more of a live feel with this album. There's something there. There's some electricity there that I feel like we haven't felt terribly recently. Yeah. And I, I don't know if it's it's the setup with the, the new engineer or if it's the setup with just the the new band members. So it's like fresh blood and it's exciting, right. but it's also not butting heads or, or being in competition with Eddie Jobson. I don't know, but you're right. There's, there's a, a level of excitement here that is, that really kind of pushes through this album and it just, it really vibes it for me. It really, it, it excites me. Yeah. It really, the, the tall spark is back. Yeah. It's nice. It's, it's very fun. And it's falling on some very dry tinder. Oh God, there's oh, fire no. everywhere. It is wildfires. 
Tull fire season. Tull fire season is in full blown. Full full blown. Full blown. It's, f- it's full, full blow. <laughs> it's fully blown. You mentioned briefly the the backing vocals when they come in on giving us a hard time, my friends. Mm-hmm. There's a couple layers. Oh, I love that. Giving us a hard time, my friends. Handing us the same line again. It's like it's true good harmony. It's three or four part harmony. Yeah, it's better than Ian like going kind of low and going a little high and it's more than what no, we're accustomed really cool. to with the end it's good so it so this this is telling me it is i mean who's credited for backing vocals on this this is telling me that we probably have pjv peter john vatis has backing vocals credit on this so yeah cool yeah so uh, how many tracks is ian how many tracks is peter john vatis don't know but regardless having that extra voice in there that extra different person's voice in there really does something. I And I think the last time we heard that, probably with Andy Giddings on, on something at some point in one of the bonus tracks or whatever, the last time we heard that with somewhat a unique different person's voice, we commented on it as well because it really does make a difference. Wasn't there some on A? Possibly. Possibly, probably. Backing vocals on A was Dave Pegg. Peggy. Peggy. Vocal harmonies, Dave Pegg. There it is. Yeah, so we did So we did have a little there, but clearly we have got some new sounds, some new vibrations. Yeah. Yeah, and, and how how interesting. Oh, oh, never mind. I take it back. Dave is also on backing vocals for Broadsword. So we could there possibly we have. That could yeah. explain all of those different sounds. That's nice. Yeah. Like it, like it. So, Nick, we were talking about, like, the sound of the 80s. Yeah. This is a little bit of a sidebar. Yeah. But I was just thinking, you know, what what were the, what was the kind of cultural, what was in the cultural soup of the 1980s? The zeitgeist? The zeitgeist, if you will. <sighs> I won't. And I won't. <laughs> I've been told not to. So, for instance, films that came out in 1982. Okay. E.T. Okay. Beastmaster. Okay. Very relevant to this whole situation. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Beastie Master, I'll take it. Sure. Tron. Okay, yeah. We're getting into some sci-fi, some so we're getting good enough technology where where the sci-fi really works and, and we're seeing new things. The Dark Crystal. Nice. Okay, great. Which very much combines that, you know, the the fantasy with the technology, with the old, with the new. I mean, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's a great example. The Last Unicorn, an animated film. Nice. Rankin Bass. Very lovely. Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. Classic Star Trek. I, I just want to note for, for Conan my... The Bar- Bar- Conan the Barbarian. The Barbarian. <laughs> my, my personal... All-time favorite movie franchise. Alien came out in 79. Aliens didn't come out until 86, so it doesn't quite fall here, unfortunately. Not, but not quite. Not, not quite. quite. <laughs> Close. But I do think that there's I do think that there's something in the Well, I do think that when we listen to this, you know, we can't help but hear some of the the sounds that influenced us from those times, which some of them do come from those films. Sure. A unique flavor, a unique color palette feel to it you know distinctly 80s yeah indeed yeah yeah yeah. nick anything else to say about this music of this song i am ready to jump into an email if you are let's take a break nick we're halfway there there. we have ourselves an email from a new writer inner oh my gosh what is this came in at the beginning of April, but we were so backlogged. Now we are finally caught up. So this is from Chris. This is from Chris. Chris writes, Hi, Omen and Nick. I'm really enjoying this podcast to the point it might be an obsession. I've stopped listening to my audiobooks and radio and have solely been listening to Talk Tall to Me. I listen to all the new ones and am up to the end of War Child on the back catalog. Really burning the candle at both ends. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna meet smack in the middle, and you're just gonna be set up for disappointment. Yeah, speaking of smack, <laughs> you're gonna go into heavy withdrawal. One thing I've found is I think I've been unplugged from the Matrix. 
I love listening to Tull and singing along. I feel I know most of the lyrics, and each song stirs a certain emotion. Listening to you guys has brought a new understanding of the songs, not better or worse, just different. But I don't see the songs the same way anymore. Oh no! <laughs> I'm not complaining, but something's changed. At times, I feel maybe I want to be plugged in again. Anyway, keep up the good work. I must be evolving as a tall skull. <laughs> well, what I always say is, if it stops working, unplug it and plug it back in again. That's it. That's IT 101. And finally, Chris wraps up. My poll question is, rate your favorite tall musicians. Let's do this in real time, Omen. Not by talent, but by your favorite in enjoyment. Tall bass player. Oh, oh my gosh, so much pressure. I think, I think... I think I have to go with Glasscock just because the, the the level of I feel like he connected to the mysteries of the bass deeper than than anyone else. Yeah. Close second being Jeffrey, you know, just yes. just because he's so cute. Okay, drummer, go. Drummer. Oh gosh. Barry probably. Barry's damn good. Barlow, Mr. Barlow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I think I mean it might change but but he he he's the one that as a tall drummer as the tall drummer mm. he's the one that comes to mind for me sure he, he brings really the is. playfulness the 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 precision all of it yeah the power yeah keyboardist you know i'm really enjoying pv P- pjv yeah i'm really enjoying peter van vess van peter jones john van ness i <laughs> you'll never get it john peter van ness <laughs> john, yes. peter john vatis <laughs> Peter John Batiste. But in terms of personality, I have to go with the ice cream man. Absolutely. John Evans. Absolutely. John Evans. 100%. Just, yep. Just because he's the videos that we've seen, he's just on another planet. Okay. Absolutely. Weird yeah. one. This is going to be odd for you. Favorite tall claghorn player. I mean, you know, Ian brings so much to the claghorn he that, does. It's, that it's but. difficult not to choose him, but I yeah. will, you know, he's a dark horse coming up from behind. I'm going to have to go with Ian. He's great. <laughs> Perfect. I was going to go, I would go with Mellotron. <laughs> F- favorite, favorite mystery, mystery player in the band, Mellotron. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris, for that lovely email and for writing in and for obsessing over the silly things that we do. Greatly appreciate it. And thank you for writing in. It's delightful to hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much. As always, anyone can write in moms at fecklessmoms.com or you can hop into the Feckless Moms website, fecklessmoms.com, and find the contact us form right on the front page. That's true. Nick, are we ready to jump back into the main portion of the show and talk about lyrics? <laughs> lyrics. Yes, I think that we ought to do that. Let's talk lyrics oh nick welcome back to the regular part of the show here we are part two you look refreshed thank you i took a mud bath i had a colonic and a martini i don't remember which i drank and which went in me but yes i had a a colonic (laughs) oh god oh i smell amazing down there no wonder it stings (laughs) so nick this is a really if you had to put this song in a box, okay. and I don't recommend you do, okay. but if you had to, what file folder would you put this song into? I mean, probably Broadsword and the Beast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. But okay. in terms of topics. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, ooh. Like if we're – we've talked about Toe, like file folders before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I think this would fall under slightly slightly topical, like evergreen topical. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, it's not Ian as a narrator telling us a, a very distinct, like, specific story. That's true. That's true. It's not a love song. It's not a love song. I think it could fit. I don't know. I think it could fit fairly comfortably with some of the stuff off of Stormwatch. Yeah. Because that's that's topical, but it's not terribly specific, you know, and and it's a little doom and gloom. Yeah, I was going to offer observation slash critique of social change. 
perfect for Stormwatch. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I like it. Totally it yeah. is. And I think I think we have a little bit of a Stormwatch hangover on this album. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think there was stuff that Ian did not resolve by the end of Stormwatch. Couldn't get to it in A for reasons of Eddie Jobson or planning for it to be a solo album. You know, it, it couldn't be a continuation for, for any number of reasons. So this is that next logical step. And sonically, it works, too. Yes, it certainly does. I also think that I want to preface all of this by saying that we are going to get a lot of the following couple of minutes wrong because (laughs) we weren't alive in the early 80s and we didn't study the economics of the transatlantic economies in the early 80s, late 70s. But I do know, I am aware that the early 80s and the 80s in general was a time of extremely volatile economic changes in the United Kingdom. We are in the years of Thatcher. Okay. We are in the years of Reagan in the US. Okay. Who, you know, we we sometimes talk about Reaganomics. Trickle down. Everybody trickle down. Everybody do the trickle down, 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 down. Right. Trickle down economics for anyone who has been under a rock for the last hundred years is the idea that you give money to the rich and it trickles down into the economy and helps everyone. Right. That makes sense. Thank you. As it turns out, the rich don't do so much trickling. It's more hoard at the top. Yeah. Do I need another $200,000? No, but I don't want you to have it. So (laughs) I'll take it. Thanks. One of the things that was happening in the UK was that the there was rising inflation. Okay. Sound familiar? F- I'm feeling it, yeah. And one of the things the the government in England was trying to do was control the, infla- the inflation by doing things like raising interest rates. Which is also happening, yeah. Cutting other social policies. Mm-hmm. And all of this combined to hit the manufacturing industry very hard, which caused the loss of over 3 million jobs. Or rather, it caused unemployment to rise to around 3 million, which... 3 million Eddie Jobsons, actually. It was, Eddie Jobson <laughs> lost 3 million jobs. <laughs> His hiring and application process was a blur. Including being the violin player and keyboardist for Jethro Tull. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was how it all started. That's it, yeah. It trickled down from there. Right. So... You know, Ian is somebody that we know is a very aware person of what's going on around him in society. Yeah. Very well read. He said to us in an email that he reads all the newspapers every day. I assume he's been doing that for a long time. So he would be very aware of all the policies, all the changes in politics that were happening and would be very aware also of the effect across the country because he was traveling across it all of the time and sitting in trains and overhearing people talk. Yeah. So I think that in a way, Ian probably was more connected to what was going on in the US and in England than some of the politicians were. I'm sure, yeah. I know that's a hot talk. It was something that he was interested in. It was something that he immersed himself in. I don't think it's it's that absurd to think at this early in time in the day i think it's really absurd to think <laughs> it's my day off <laughs> you you made me get on this call but but also you know i think that for anyone who says that economics is boring or dull i couldn't agree more it is so <laughs> so boring to think about but i try to make an effort to be aware of it because it's important and it affects every one of us the only thing better than a switcheroo, a change in status, is an expected change in status, but a a support in status instead. <laughs> yes. I think they call that in the in the industry a joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I listen to the Marketplace Morning Report in the shower every morning. You fall right to sleep. <laughs> My water bill is crazy. <laughs> And I've been following, you know, some of the some of the efforts to cool down the inflation that we're currently experiencing. And it's right. that's scary. And, you know, the, the factors that are at play are so massive that there's 
in a sense, very little that anyone could do about it. So, I know, yeah. But at the same time, the politicians always make a big show out of saying, well, we're going to do this and we're doing this and look at all the success we've had with this. And meanwhile, the world is falling apart around them. Yeah, because what can a senator from from Florida do when there's a war in Ukraine and exactly Russia, we're not doing Russian oil. Yeah, they can talk. They can fake the clasp a lot. Yeah, thank you. That's exactly it. They can fake. They can pretend they can put on that facade. Yeah. So let's get into the specific lyrics, as we probably should have done 10 minutes ago. Fallen on hard times, but it feels good to know that milk and honey is just around the bend. Falling on hard times, but it feels good to know that milk and honey is just around the bend. Wow. Okay. Already so much in here. Yeah. The land of milk and honey, of course, is a phrase that is used multiple times in the Bible, specifically and maybe earliest in the book of... In the, the cookbook of Revelation? No, it's... First it's, you it's, add the milk, then a drop of honey. I believe first it's... The first mention of it is in Exodus. Okay. I'm paraphrasing God's words here. So I've come to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and bring them to the land that is good and spacious, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Right. So it is a it is a description of the land of Israel, the spiritual home of the of the Jewish people. So there's an implication of of richness and fertility, not only in a physical sense, but also it's almost an implication of, of spiritual richness and 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 what is deserved. Right. It is it is the paradise and, and the, the, the Jews are being brought home to that as their reward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in, but in this case, in the song, we have the false prophets, one could say, of the politicians right. saying, yes, we know you're all losing your jobs. Yes, I know that bread is, you know, 20 percent more expensive than it was and wages are stagnating. But if you just push through for the next couple of Mm-hmm. Yeah. And reelect me. Deal with it. Just deal with it. Yep. Everything's going to be great and we're going to be in this period of pro- of prosperity. Yeah. Either either reelect me or my term limits up anyway, so I got I got my job out of it, so. Right, exactly. And, and there's another reference here, running on bad lines. Okay. Got to run as we go. Tear up tear up the overdraft again. Running on bad lines. We better run as we go. To me, that that makes me think of two different things. One is that could it be that the train lines haven't been invested been invested in, and so you're literally running on bad oh, lines, okay. or is that you are running your business on a bad line of credit? That's more what I think, just based on the overdraft reference. Yeah, I think that's probably it. The line of credit, and there's also a, a line of. It's Black Friday. It's where you finally make a profit in your business. You know, it's it's there's a, a line where you have to meet a certain sure. amount of income, you know, and if if not enough business is coming in, if you're paying too much for your product and can't sell it for enough, you're never going to make enough money to keep the to business borrow. open. And, and then you have to borrow. Yeah. And then you just you just bury yourself in debt. And countries do that. Every country is buried Every in country, debt. yeah, which is confusing to me. <laughs> How can absurd. every single country yeah. <laughs> be in debt? Who's, who's collecting? <laughs> yeah, no one's collecting. It's absurd. Now, the other thought that I had was perhaps they were talking about bad lines of cocaine. I mean, it is the 80s. It is the 80s. And the lines probably were not, you know, they could have been cut with chalk. I was going to say, is it bad? Is it a bad line because it's not good coke? Or is it a bad line because it's kind of squiggly and it's not, it's not straight? Because your hands are shaking from having done too much from coke too much not, coke. Not, not, yeah, not sure. I've never done coke. It's a mystery. I've never. I do just enough coke, which is which is no coke. I, that's the <laughs> that's the answer. That's just enough. Never, never is too many times. <laughs> oh dear, Prime Minister, it's all such a mess. Go right ahead and pull the rotten tooth. Oh dear, Prime Minister, it's all such a mess. Go right ahead. Yep. Another another bit of I think the the land of milk and honey is just around the bend. It's it feels like a promise from politicians. Like oh, if we just if we do this, if we bite the bullet, if we pull the tooth, if we get rid of 
healthcare. If we get rid of this or yeah. this or this, yeah. we have more money to spend elsewhere. This is what's causing the problem. So yes, let's get rid exactly. of it. Exactly. That's been a tradition of politicians since the dawn of time, no doubt, is to is to scapegoat and to say, well, you yes. know, the problem is really this group here. It's 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 the other party. It's the the gays. It's the unions. That's what I wonder if in this context is is because um, I know that Thatcher was very anti-union. Maggie, yeah. Was that the rotten tooth? Could be. Well, Mr. President, you've been put to the test. Come clean for once and hit us with the truth. <laughs> very funny. <laughs> oh, Mr. President, you've been put to the test. Come clean for once and hit us with the truth. In an American context. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty much the same thing. You know, no president wants to deliver bad news, so it's always couched in, in flowery language. And yeah. regardless of what the language is, whether they're being honest or not, the unemployment numbers speak and the inflation numbers speak and that president is not reelected, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and and even even presenting something that is truthful. I mean, I, I, I'm on the Twitter sometimes and I saw- How dare you? You know, Joe Biden tweeting, you know, this is the most, this, the last year has been the fastest- drop in the unemployment rate in the history of our country or or since this date. It's like, that's true. That is a true fact. But it doesn't take into account the fact that wages of, you know, even though they're going up, they are being outstripped by inflation, that housing prices are out of control, that women are paid 60% less, that exactly cost of living goes up and and salaries do not, you know, you you could say anything. My dog had puppies today. Fantastic. Your car's on fire. I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> so, you know, the, the notion of truth, oh gosh, especially in this day and age is, is so, I feel like, I feel like sometimes Ian puts on his, his Cassandra hat. Oh, puts sure. Puts on his Cassandra dress. Yeah. Yep. Does the dance of the seven bales and sees into the future for us. And nobody believes him. Or nobody gives a shit. Everyone is so distracted by how good he looks in the dress that they forget his predictions of the future. I mean, that helps. That certainly helps. But it's also, as you said, you know, this kind of cyclical thing that this could be, this song could work in so many different contexts in time. Mm -hmm. Giving us a hard time, my friends, handing us the same line again. Giving us a hard time, my friends, handing us the same line again. Politicians always give yeah. the people the same line, no matter what's happening. Right. As soon as they had to be elected and they weren't just in power because they killed people for it or or their daddies had the power. Or they killed their daddies for or it. Or they killed their daddies for that power. As soon as that happened, politicians started doing everything within their power to stay in power. Or continued to do everything within their power to yeah. stay in power. It's just that they had to change tack. That's all. So... Nick, in the previous song in the class, but we have this kind of laying out of the darkness of the world and all the bad things Uh and, you know, how we all have the fear about connecting. And then we have a verse that says, but we still have to connect. It's really important. You know, it's it's, it's kind of the the most important thing in life. I'm struggling to find the kind of positive thing in this song. You know, the most positive thing that that we have is the and this is, you know, my opinion, is the fourth verse. Now they've repossessed the Rolls Royce and the Mink. Now they've repossessed the Rolls Royce and the Mink. Where the positive part of it is that it's not just the, the working people's getting hurt by the, the economic oh, okay. troubles, that it's also the rich being affected by it. Okay. Really, the first the first couplet, falling on hard times, but it feels good to know the milk and honey's just around the bend. There's a positivity there, even though it's like... It's blinders. You're not looking at anything else. You're just kind of head down. You're like, oh, we're getting through to the good stuff. It reminds me of the the picture, the cartoon of the the horse with the stick attached to its back with the carrot dangling in front of it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Plow through it. Deal with it. You got to. Yeah. There's no other way. Tighten the belt. I mean, that is... That's the only positive thing that I can see, but it's couched in that like, oh, he's just... He's he's just brainwashed. He's not that's not actually good. Well, and then when we get to the first stanza, we do get the kind of resistance to it. Somebody wake me. I've been sleeping too long. Oh, I don't have to take this lying down. You can keep your promises. Shove them where they belong. 
Don't ask me to the party, won't be around. Somebody wake me, I've been sleeping too long. Oh, I don't have to take this lying down. You can keep your promises, shove them where they belong. Don't ask me to the party, won't be around. So there's the sense of standing up for oneself, or, or at least refusing any longer to buy into the official narrative. Yeah. You know what this somehow reminds me of, and I don't know if this is completely relevant, but do you know the quote from Diogenes, who is the 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 Greek philosopher who like lived in a barrel on the street and refused to wear clothes? Oh, yeah. He said, in a rich man's house, the only appropriate place to spit is in his face. <laughs> you heard that? No, I've not. That's that's That made me cackle. That's very good. <laughs> But that's kind of what this this part reminds me of, this kind of center of the song. It's like a little bit of of resistance of, of yeah. you know, saying, you know, look, these are real people's lives. We're not going to be people aren't going to be quiet about this, about these conditions forever. At some point, the worm will turn, as we talked about last week. It's it's an awareness. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's very interesting that the line starts with somebody wake me. I've been sleeping too long. By virtue of saying that, he's aware. He is already awake. <laughs> right? He knows what's going on. Yeah. Unless the somebody somebody wake me is like, this is all a bad dream, maybe. You know, it's so oh, bad, this can't be real. I wonder if there's a sense of it like, you know, sometimes we get desensitized to the world around us. And, you know, the last number of years have been a good example of that, where it's like we get used to these really horrible situations and conditions. And and then occasionally, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have this moment where I'm like, oh, my God, this is all all of this is absolutely insane. Yeah. And then, you know, because it's kind of too hard to deal with mentally, you go back into that yeah. like, yeah, well, I'm just going to focus on me and I'll make dinner and watch some TV. <laughs> Right, yeah. The world falling apart around me because otherwise it's too hard. You go insane. Either you, you go insane or you become a political activist, I guess. Those are your two options if you really want to to really deep dive into it. I was telling my mother the other day that I think I, I think I found my ideal career path that I want to move into. It's not it doesn't have anything to do with entertainment or the corporate world or anything or carpentry. I've tried all those. I think that I really want to become a mushroom growing in the forest. Not a mushroom farmer. You want to be a yeah. mushroom. I want to be an expression of a vast underground mycelial network. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be a peaceful life. Nick, anything else to say about Fallen on Hard Times? Uh, I just, I really like the, it's the, the line is like the darkest line of, of the song. Looking for sunshine, oh, but it's black and it's cold. Looking for Well, that's just a description of England. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah, that's all it was. It's, that's the weather report. Yeah, it's just no. I, I, yeah, I agree. There's, I, I think you really hit on a, a kind of an important point that there is no positivity here. This is, this is really, again, why it smacks of Stormwatch so much. It's really fairly doom and gloom. It's kind of it's it's the I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah. Right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna write a song about it. I'm gonna write a song with some amazing mandolin. Yeah, exactly. Take that, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> I've decided to outlaw mandolins. Mandolins are the real drain on our economy. <laughs> Too much labor is taken in tuning them. The union of the mandolin players are gone. I have too much power. <laughs> Too many power cords. <laughs> power cord on a mandolin. <laughs> Nick, what are we listening to uh, next week? Uh, next week uh, is the fourth track off of Broadsword and the Beast. It is Flying Colors. Oh, it's going to be a doozy. It's going to be bright and flighty. Brighty. It's going to be brighty. Until next week, the land of milk and honey is just one click away. 
to our Patreon page, where you can give us $5 a month to gain access to our Discord, to our additional episodes once a month, one of Outtake Tall to Me and one of Feckless, where we talk about kind of random stuff. And those episodes are Full of milky honeys. The honey is so milky and the milk is so honey. It's time for you to wake up. You've been asleep too long. Get up, get dressed, wear your favorite Talk Tall to Me t-shirt. There are four designs currently in our T Public page. You can find the link for that in our show notes. Oh, Mr. President, come clean for once and hit us with the truth. The truth about what you think of this podcast preferably in the form of a five-star rating and positive review. That'd be great, yeah. Yeah. Until next week, I am the sunshine that you are looking for, Nick McGill. I am the repossessed mink, Omen Said. <laughs> that was your screen name, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. We are running on good lines, the feckless moms. And this is raising a holy stink... Talk tall to me. Eh, oh, someone's at the door. Oh, Jeff, they didn't even use the doorbell. Oh, good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, hello there, Mr. Piemonte. Uh, my my name is Jimmy the Dog, and uh, unfortunately, I'm here on account of your creditors, and I'm going to have to repossess some of your items that have been identified by the IRS as needing to be given to the bank, you see, to settle your debts. I'm sorry about that, sir. Oh, uh, uh, hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I've been notified of this, but I had to let the maid go who reads my mail, so... That's all right. That's all right, Mister Piemonte. I've got a, I've got a list right here. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. It's, it's not going to be everything. It's just a couple of items. Let's see. I hope it's nothing important. Do you have your diamond encrusted hair dryer? Yes. You I'm need, gonna you... need that in this box here. No. Oh. Oh dear. Um. All right. I was just, I was just fondling it lovingly. Here, here you go. That's, I'll wipe off the fondle, but, uh, you know, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but actually a regular hairdryer works just as well. You don't need the diamonds on it. But it doesn't have diamonds. Goodbye, sweet one. I'll miss you. Okay. Uh, so I've got, uh, I've got on the list here, let's see it. It's a, a $9,000 ball of yarn. Yes. Tiffany's. Yes, right. It, 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 it is, it is made from the hair of a woman named Tiffany, who worked at Tiffany's. That's right, yes. Tiffany of Tiffany's, yes. Right. I'm gonna need that. I'm gonna need that in the box, please. But I was I was watching my cat play with it, and now what will muffins play with? You know what? Don't worry about that, because actually I'm gonna need muffins. That was the next thing on my list here. Oh, Got one muffins. Senegalese trained jumping cat. Oh. AKA muffins. Muffins. Goodbye, muffins. You were you were so nice to play with. Uh, I, I will miss you. Do let him keep the ball, if you would. Listen, you know, I know this is stressful. I know this is stressful for you. It is. Would you like a drink? I would, yes, yes. Well, I'm I'm sorry, because you're going to have to give up your $1,800,000 liquor collection right over there, starting with the 50-year-old Glen Vintage. Oh, not Glen. And, and and you know what? I, I actually I need the uh, I need the ice cube maker as well. I know that costs you about $7,500. Yes, well, it's in in the shape of various body parts that I had to get plaster cast molded and then shrunken down, and I could build a little skeleton out of myself in ice cubes and then drink it. Oh, that sounds amazing, and I'm jealous and happy for your experience. Glad that you've had that time, but put the Hamaka Schlemmer ice cube maker in the box if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I do mind, but here, ah, ah, there, you, there you are. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know what? I just need you to sign off on this document here. Do you mind signing this right here? What if I don't sign? Well, then I will have to break your legs because oh. that's the that's the kind of collection agent I am. You know, there's different types. Yes, you're not quite the polite kind, are you? Yes. I try to be polite, especially when I have to break the legs because I know it makes people feel bad. Oh, yeah, yes, it would. Um, I suppose I'll sign it here. Yes. Do it. I'm going to keep the pen. 
oh. because I recognize that as a Gucci exclusive. It is. Yes, I, I happen to know. Looks, Listen, I know that's a good pen, but that is going to pay off all of your daughter's college. Oh, I thought that was paid off already. No, you you paid off. Let's see. You uh, you paid off her assault charges. That's right. Yes, yes. From the Dolce & Gabbana pasta factory incident. When she was in college. Yes, that, yes. that makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes it was yes, a $5,000 yes. bill at the Dolce & Gabbana pasta plant. Yes. Over... Over a bowl of uh, specialty fettuccine. Yes, I, I don't. I don't blame her. It's very good pasta. Yes. No, of course. Oh my God, I've had it a couple times. One last thing. You oh, can choose. Oh, oh, okay. One of the following. Yes, one of the following. Would you All like right. to give up your private island off the coast of Madagascar, mm. or your prized collection of? Vintage Jethro Tull records that are printed on precious metals. Well, they were going to be my Desert Island discs, but if I don't have a Desert Island, what am I going to do? I know, it's a real Catch-22 situation. It really Listen, is. Listen, I tell you what, I'll make you a yeah. trade. Yes. Oh, oh, can you do that? Yes, I can, I can, because I'm, uh, I'm, a, not a, I'm a not licensed uh, re- repository man. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take... I'll take both of them. I'll take the what? island and I'll take the records. But I'll give you something more valuable than either of them combined. The most valuable thing you've ever had. I am intrigued. Please. It's called a podcast. What? Yes. Listen to this. I'm in love. Take it all. I just need this. It sounded funny because it was playing in your underpool speakers. Oh, do I get to keep the pool? No, goodbye!